the glorious and terrible history of conquest, one name towers above all others. One warrior, one king, one legend, Alexander the Great. Never in all the world was there another like him. Born of a ruthless mother. He believed that she was a consort of some higher being. Educated by a brilliant philosopher. One of the most influential thinkers in the world, Aristotle. Driven by a domineering father. They swiftly drew their swords. Then the blood really flowed. A Macedonian warrior at 14. A general at 18. King at 20. Commanding 40,000 troops hungry for total war. Leaving a grand legacy and a controversial history that endure to this day. More than 2,000 years ago, this was the home of a man who many consider to be the greatest warrior in history. We are in northern Greece, at the remains of the ancient city of Pella, where once stood the palace of King Philip II of Macedon, the father of Alexander the Great. In the 4th century BC, Alexander was raised here to conquer the world. We are going to explore the journey of those conquests, which span 12 years, 22,000 miles, and cover the territories of what are now Greece, Turkey, Lebanon, Egypt, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. We're going to examine the complex personality of a man who may have considered himself to be a god, and yet who died a mere mortal at the age of 32. Like Alexander, we too have a mission, to answer questions that have been debated by historians for centuries. Who was Alexander? What drove him on? And how could he, at such a young age, have conquered such a vast empire? Most of what we know about Alexander the Great comes from four ancient historians who wrote several hundred years after Alexander died in 323 BC. They base their manuscripts on the journals of men who lived and fought alongside the legendary warrior. The historians include Arian, a Greek author and statesman, Diodorus of Sicily, Curtius Rufus of Rome, and the Greek philosopher Plutarch, the only writer to document Alexander's boyhood and devote considerable time to analyzing his character. When a portrait painter sets out to create a likeness, he relies above all upon the face and the expression of the eyes and pays less attention to the other parts of the body. In the same way, it is my task to dwell upon those actions which illuminate the workings of the soul. And so we begin the astonishing tale of one man whose short life of 32 years gave him historic immortality. It is 356 BC, the year of Alexander's birth. In an area of northern Greece known as Macedonia, or Macedon, King Philip II rules a population that other Greeks consider inferior. We get this impression that the Macedonians are barely literate, that they are boorish, that they are beneath the high level of culture that is uh, exhibited by many Athenians, and, and furthermore, that they're dangerous, as represented by the king, Philip II. But the Macedonians are very wealthy. They control areas filled with gold and silver mines. Philip exploits these riches to the fullest. He assembles, trains, and equips an army that is one of the finest in the world. The reign of Philip was a developing awful shock for them that this disorganized Macedonian kingdom had suddenly become organized. Thanks to the mines, it had enormous economic power. But where there is power, there is also passion. In 357 BC, at age 26, Philip becomes passionately involved with a young woman named Olympias from the Greek region of Epirus. He asks her hand in marriage, and Olympias agrees, 
to become one of his numerous brides. He certainly did have the reputation of he married a fresh wife with every campaign he undertook. The object of that remark being uh, that he wanted to make himself diplomatically safe by contracting these various alliances. Philip is smitten with the beauty of Olympias, but he is not fully aware that she has an eccentric, wild side, associating herself with mystic cults and mythologies. She's a fiery character, and she is political, she is religious, but above all, she's dynastic. Make no mistake about it, Olympias' main interest throughout her life was clearly getting her son Alexander onto the throne. I think she was, as far as the succession of her son Alexander was concerned, absolutely ruthless. Philip's marriage to Olympias brings the king greater worries and challenges than he ever faced on a field of battle. On the night before the marriage was consummated, the bride dreamed that her womb was struck by a thunderbolt. Philip saw himself in a dream, in the act of sealing up his wife's womb, and upon the seal there was the figure of a lion. At another time, a serpent was seen stretched out at Olympias' side as she slept. And this weakened Philip's passion and cooled his affection for her. From that time on, he seldom came to sleep with her. Either he was afraid she would cast some evil spell upon him, or else he believed that she was a consort of some higher being. The relationship between Philip and Olympias is destined to be a tumultuous one. Philip himself secretly witnesses the serpent lying in bed with Olympias. The experience concerns him greatly. As the king of all Greek gods, Zeus is frequently represented in the form of a serpent. Philip feels a burning desire to find out if the child to be born to Olympias was fathered by himself, or possibly, though unimaginably, by Zeus. There is only one place for Philip to obtain an answer. The Oracle of Apollo at Delphi. This is how Delphi appeared in the 4th century BC. A bustling center of worship, commerce and athletic competition. This is Delphi today. The columns of the Temple of Apollo still stand majestically on a magnificent hillside overlooking the Gulf of Corinth. For us, when we hear the word, the Oracle of Delphi, what we understand is the place. The person is the prophet. What she told us was a prophecy. So that's the holy place that is dedicated to Apollo. And Apollo was the sun god, the god of music and poetry. On the other hand, in Delphi, Apollo could tell people the future, so he had that special charisma. Therefore, we call it an oracle. So that's the oracle of Delphi. Inside the oracle, you can see the treasuries, the statues, the dedications, the temple. That's the most important building. Underneath was the cellar, the holy room. Aviton, there was the priestess. From there, she would tell people the future. In the months before Alexander's birth in 356 BC, there is only one question that Philip wants to ask the oracle at Delphi. Will his child be the son of a mortal or a god? Philip sends an emissary here to Delphi to consult with the oracle of Apollo about the meaning of what he has witnessed. The oracle, while not directly acknowledging that Alexander would be the son of a god, tells Philip to make sacrifices to Zeus and to revere him above all other deities. <laughs> 